not working. Hi everybody and we are so excited to have you all joining us today. We are so lucky to have uh, Jennifer Jezekel who is a PT from the Hospital Special Surgery um, joining us to talk about everything about movement and activity and things that we can do during these times. Um, Jennifer has a passion for the rehabilitation management of children with cerebral palsy and has a particular interest in gait analysis and orthopedic management. And so when she's not at HSS, she also serves as a lab instructor for the program in physical therapy at Columbia University. So Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. And so today I think we really wanna get into what is activity? What does it mean? You know, what should we all be trying to do during these times? And particularly, you know, we know it's been really difficult for a lot of people um, because of the pandemic. But, you know, what are some of the things that we need to know just from the outset? Like how much physical activity should, so say for example, I'm a, a mother of a child with cerebral palsy, you know, what, what activity should my child be doing? Like, is there a minimum number? Like, what should we be aiming for each day? Yeah, sure. No, I think that's a great place to start. Um, and so when we think about exercise, it is really a form of physical activity. And when we think about um, why we do it, it's to perform, you know, to basically improve your physical fitness. And so there's several different components of fitness. So we think about things like muscle strength and muscle endurance and what we think about as like aerobic conditioning or capacity. Um, and so there's been a lot of research that's been done within our field, tremendous work really to kind of help us establish guidelines, um, either as a practitioner or as someone who you know, is, is guiding someone in terms of either getting started with the program or sort of what to expect. And so I think from the outset in general, one sort of good thing to sort of embrace here is that doing something every day is, is really better than doing nothing at all. So I think that's sort of a good place to start. Um, but, and also when you're getting started, I think it depends a little bit on what your initial activity level might be. And of course, you know, that's going to look a little bit different if it's a young child or an adult uh, and sort of what your, what your baseline level of activity might be. So I think that's an important consideration uh, in terms of thinking about getting started. Um, so in terms of these sort of parameters or guidelines that we have, we kind of embrace this idea of a fit, uh, the principles of fit. So F-I-T-T. -I okay, I love that. So F-I-T-T, -T, everybody, the things that we've got to remember. So when we break it down, the F is for frequency. And so that really just pertains to how many times a week you might be engaging in the activity. The I is for intensity. And so if it's, for example, muscle strengthening, it might be the amount of resistance or the amount of weight you're using. Or if it's something aerobic, it might be sort of the, the, the zone in which you prefer your heart rate to be as sort of like a target. So that refers to the intensity. Uh, the first T is for time. And so as it suggests, it's sort of the amount of time that you're going to do it. And then the type is really, uh, again, as it suggests, the activity. So it might be something like walking or swimming. So we kind of embrace these principles when we're starting to think about really developing what we consider an exercise prescription. Um, and so if, if it's for muscle strengthening, some of the guidelines uh, that exist would suggest that someone's engaging in these activities, let's say as a start, uh, two to three times a week um, for a minimum of, let's say, 20 minutes per session. Uh, and if you're looking to kind of get an effect of improvement, you might need to sort of consider the amount or the dose that you're doing versus if you're just trying to kind of maintain uh, what's already existing. So I think those are two sort of important distinctions to make to some regard. Um, and I think as adults, you know, we're aware of these different things that, you know, we're told, okay, you should all try to do, you know, this certain amount of activity two to three times a week that's harder, but then you should also try to do activity almost every day you know, to remain healthy and active. So for children, that same thing does apply as well. It's just potentially what the activity might be different, the activity that they choose to do. Exactly, yeah. So I think that's a great, great kind of, you know, distinction to make. There's a difference between dedicated exercise where you're, you're looking to kind of achieve a certain number of repetitions for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Again, to sort of see a very specific training effect versus just engaging in physical activity, which would be synonymous with, let's say, you know, getting up out of the chair and walking around or climbing the stairs. So I think it's, you know, those two things go hand in hand, um, but certainly sort of, if you're looking to kind of see an effect over a period of time, you, you know, it's gonna have to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more programmatic, if you will, than just sort of getting up and moving around. Sure. And then to individuals with disabilities and, you know, 
is it there's sort of a thing that a lot of people hear is that they have to work twice as hard to get the same benefits is that true or, or is that really sort of something that's differing depending on the individual yeah, that's a great question. So I think, you know, for a long time, a lot of the guidelines that we had available for us, to us rather, were really the same for typically developing individuals. Uh, and so I think, you know, we've really seen some of these guidelines emerge really within the last five or six years, um, mm -hmm. which sounds kind of surprising. Um, and so I think they borrow a bit from what's expected, um, but I think the length of time, uh, perhaps that you might need to, to, to engage in this activity to really see a benefit or an effect is going to be a bit longer, perhaps than in, in, a, a, in an individual that doesn't have CP, for example. And we'll share after this, just to make sure everyone has it, we'll share the guidelines and all those different things and have it all written out for everybody um, so that they can go and have a look and go, all right, well, this is where I'm at. What should I be doing? Because I think it's really important for everyone to work out, A, what their baseline is, as you mentioned previously, and, you know, talk to their provider, talk to their physical therapist to work out what a program could look like, but we can give them some sort of rough guidelines to help start that discussion. For sure. I think in these cases, it's very helpful to have something tangible. Uh, I know even for myself, you know, you know if, if it's vague, I'm, I'm not likely to stick with it. So I think having really clear steps as to how to get started and what that might look like over a period of time is really great. So I think that's a really good way to actually get into this next thing. So how to establish activity routines, you know, during these times, particularly, you know, it's all, it's pretty tricky for all of us. I know some of us have sort of been stuck inside for a long period of time or, you know, the gym <laughs> what we usually would have done. So, you know, as we think about as children and adolescents sort of transition back into this academic year, um, you know, and they're adjusting to all different schedules that are constantly changing. What are some ways to establish healthy routines to ensure that, you know, everyone does remain physically active? Yeah, no, no great question. And I think for sure, one thing that's certain is we're all embracing sort of this constant change and flux in terms of what you know, we're, we're needing to do in our lives because of the pandemic. But I think a common thread for sure is that many of us are just having a hard time establishing, you know, a routine and might have seen some changes in just how we feel over time because we've had less opportunities to sort of be active. Um, and I think in some cases, because perhaps younger children and adolescents are now, you know, doing these virtual learning models where they're at home, or if you're an adult working from home, I think the lines between work and, and rest and recreation have blurred a little bit. And so I think there are a few things that you can try to do to, uh, to help with this in terms of just establishing a routine here. I think one is scheduling the physical activity and exercise, um, just the same way that you would schedule a meeting, you'd schedule the time that you have to arrive to school, the time that you might have therapy. I think you really need to hold yourself to sort of having some type of schedule. Um, and it might look a little bit different based on what you know the demands of the day are. You might decide, it's best for me to wake up in the morning and get this done in one big burst. Or if you're sitting for prolonged periods of time throughout the day, you might decide to kind of intersperse it throughout your day because uh, you're trying to combat some of the effects of just sitting for a long period of time. And I think one of the other things that can be quite helpful, especially if you're doing all these other things in your home environment, and as you said, you can't get to, let's say, the gym or rec center or what have you, um, I think also sort of dedicating a very specific part of your home, if at all possible, that you're doing the exercise and physical activity in can go a long way as well. So it's per perhaps separate from the place that you're logging in and, and attending school um, or doing work from home. So I think kind of differentiating those two uh, is also very important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, change of scenery, even if it is just a different room, is, you know, really good for all of us. And particularly when we're thinking about the motivation that it requires around exercise and those different pieces. So, you know, with everyone experiencing less movement throughout the day, you know, I think overall, we've probably all become a little bit more sedentary, you know, during the pandemic. Um, and through these different do you have any specific suggestions to promote and incorporate this physical activity during the day? You've just said, you know, maybe in a different room in the house, like when it is, but are there any other, you know, elements that could help? Yes, sure. I think, you know, if it's, if it's a young child, I think you have to, I think, uh, incorporate the fun factor. And I think that goes true for adults as well. So I think it's something like for, again, for a young child, maybe it's making it more of a game activity. Um, so maybe it's musical chairs and the child's allowed to select the music that's played and there's some element of, I need to move quickly in order to get to the seat. Um, if it's, you know, that you're an adult, maybe again, you're putting on, you know, tunes in the background that you enjoy. You have to kind of make it fun because um, <clears throat> I think that's gonna help you stick with it. 
And I love the idea of music and musical chairs particularly. I've never used that one. You know, I'm a PT myself. And so, you know, it's always great to hear other people's ideas. But musical chairs is a family. You know, it's usually reserved for children's birthday parties. But I think that is a, as a piece, particularly if there is a goal where transitions are important and, and you're working on transitions as a goal and um, thinking about how to, you know, work on those and practice those throughout the day. Um, yeah, musical chairs is a great opportunity. Yeah. And I think another thing too, is just to start to think about sort of, you know, reflecting on what you're already doing in the day and thinking about ways that you might be able to alter what you're doing to kind of, again, just get exposure to more activity. So maybe it's instead of sitting to do meal prep in the kitchen, maybe you're standing up to do it. Um, maybe if you live in a building that has flights of stairs and you otherwise would take the elevator, maybe you're choosing to do one flight of stairs uh, to kind of incorporate that, you know, activity throughout the day. So just kind of thinking about ways you can incorporate it into what's already happening in your day, um, I think a little bit goes a long way and cumulatively um, can just help you kind of break some of these patterns of not having the opportunities um, to get out and do some of the things that you were probably doing before the pandemic. And I think, you know, one thing that I know I personally benefit for is actually group exercise. You know, I find it really hard to self-motivate when I'm on my own. And I think this is sort of really tricky right now. So thinking about that peer interaction and how to do that. So peer-based learning, what's out there right now to help everyone who wants to, you know, do things with their friends? For sure, yeah. And that's, you know, I think a very real thing that many of us are experiencing. Um, and so I think for younger children, you know, I think we know that in terms of motor skill acquisition, that's such a big part of, of that being successful is really being able to model what their peers are doing. And so, yes, the question is, what, what does my child do if they're not in a school setting or a daycare setting where they're around other kids and learning from, from their peers? Um, so I think for younger children, you know, one suggestion, if it's possible to incorporate, um, you know, if there's younger or older siblings in the home that can kind of, as, as we mentioned before, whether there's family activities that can be done, um, I think that that can be helpful. And I think for, you know, young adults, adolescents and adults alike, I think you can consider maybe arranging a virtual session or a date with a friend so that you actually engage in physical activity together. Um, so I think this could be motivating and fun, but also sort of a level of accountability. I think if you set up, you know, to meet someone at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday, hopefully, you know, you can hold each other accountable to that. Um, and I think that can go a long way as well. And I do think that we've seen, you know, certainly um, there's definitely more resources becoming available because there's such a need for it. Um, and so just to name a few, I think that you know, the Achilles International has some things on their website that you can either do some components of, um, you know, pre-recorded workout sessions, um, or there's some options for live sessions, although I think those are probably not as, as available. Um, <clears throat> but I do think in time, we're going to see more and more of these resources becoming uh, available because there's just going to be a great need for them. Absolutely. And, you know, we have <laughs> got some, a list of resources as well, particularly for young adults. There's some incredible uh, individuals actually who have cerebral palsy, who are uh, personal trainers, who have created programs that you can now do online, which are, you know, and we will make sure that we share all of those with you. We've just had Julie. Uh, thank you so much for obviously joining us today. You know, we want to know where everyone else is coming from as well. So please in the comments section, if you've got any questions or, you know, let us know where you're um, listening into from today. But if we keep moving on with some of these sort of other questions that we're thinking about, um, you know, loss of function and actually decreasing skills during this time, is that something to worry about? Is it something to, you know, think about, okay, I was able to do this before, but now I'm not, you know, is that, you know, how can you decide whether, it, okay, it's, it's a decrease in skills because I've stopped practicing something and I'm not as active or there's a decrease in schools, there might be something else going on. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And sometimes hard to kind of completely know at the outset. I think if you're, if you or your child sort of is experiencing a particular change in function, and that could be that there's just, if it's a younger child who's sort of still in that trajectory of um, acquiring, you know, different motor skills, and you sort of see that it seems a little bit paused or um, maybe a little bit more labor to do some of the activities that they had been doing previously. <clears throat> if there's a change, you know, it may warrant that, you know, you're checking in with a specialist with a, you know, with a physical therapist that can kind of help better sort of tease out what may be going on. Cause it could very well be, you know, a very, very much of it could be related to the fact that they've just had less opportunities for general practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, 
uh, for adults, you know, you might be experiencing something a little bit different where you're noticing that when you do a climb the flight of stairs that you're just feeling super fatigued um, after you've done it. And so I think once again, you know, um, it may be, you know, if you're interested in perhaps, you know, starting an exercise program, it might be the time that you either resume something that you've done before that worked or that you're checking in with the PT to kind of get started up with a program to kind of address some of those concerns that you might be having. So I think that that's a very real and possible thing um, that, you know, you might just need to, you know, think about, you know, checking in with the PT and, and kind of delving into what could be going on a bit more there. Yeah, no, I think it's so important mm -hmm. that all of us um, at times, you know, if there is, if you're feeling something that's different, if you're doing an activity that's new, for example, and you're experiencing pain that you hadn't felt before, you know, sometimes that can be put down to just general sort of exercise pain or something like that. But other times, you know, there may be something else going on. So it's always good if you're ever starting a new routine or if you're mixing up your routine um, to make sure that you check in with your healthcare providers. For sure. Yes. Especially oh, yeah, trainer at the gym, if that's who you use as well, you know, I think it, it doesn't necessarily always have to go through the medical uh, way with exercise, but just making sure that you are checking in with someone if you're feeling that something else is changing or something feels different. Exactly. Yes. Especially with pain and different things like that, for sure. Um, you know, we've got a question coming in and I think this is sort of a more medical question. So Julia, um, thank you for asking. If the child has bronchitis, should they be tested for COVID, especially by the mother? So I think, you know, any time right now, if somebody is experiencing any respiratory illness, you know, please go see your doctor, um, you know, go get checked out. It's really important. Um, and, you know, that's all we will say on that one. I think, you know, absolutely go uh, check in with your healthcare provider. You know, if you're concerned about going to do it in person, a lot of people now are offering telehealth visits. So yes, please check in with them. That's really important. So is there any other sorts of things that when we're thinking about, you know, what's next and, and what other activities? Can you give us some examples? You know, we've talked about some ones and let's start with kids. Let's start with some fun examples that you can do within the home that can really help um, children stay motivated and, you know, have fun as a family. Sure, yeah. So I think, you know, one thing that tends to work often with, you know, kids, for example, if they just had, you know, a, a session where they're playing and there's things all strewn about the room, you know, kind of making the cleanup time a bit fun. So if there's lots of things on the floor, having them have to squat down to bend and pick them up and put them away and reach in different positions um, could be one could be one way, although maybe not as fun for children, but definitely part of the process of having fun and playing. Um, but I find that, you know, that's again, just something that's very natural uh, in terms of part of the day. Um, sure. And I think for, um, you know, getting started with some of these things, I think, you know, I don't think we mentioned this just yet, but I, I think it's also good to sort of establish some mechanism to kind of um, motivate with uh, seeing how they change over time. So let's say, for example, um, it's, you know, monitoring progress with something like, how many times can I get in and out of a chair in 30 seconds? And so you do it once and see, okay, I can get up and out, you know, of the chair six times. And then in two weeks, you know, you've worked on some things and you reassess I think that can go a long way in terms of helping, you know, particularly, you know, children and, you know, adolescents kind of stay on track with monitoring their progress and being really a part of it and seeing some of the, um, you know, changes that can occur by just, you know, focusing on a particular activity. So I think that that's important to mention here as well. Sure. Um, and what when it comes to sort of specificity and sort of a crossover of skills, you know, I think when we talk about different goal setting and working out what activity may or may be, uh, may or may not be best for a certain individual. And, um, you know, how, how do you sort of go through that path at home? You know, like if you, if you're not having that sort of structured uh, PT sort of intervention. Yeah. And that, Great question. I think for sure you mentioned sort of the, the, the buzzword in terms of a goal. I think if you're yes. doing something, you have to have, you know, a reason for doing it. And again, you know, if it's that you're looking to kind of improve your aerobic capacity so that you're not so tired when you're climbing up and down the stairs, for example, um, I think that, you know, the things that you're going to be doing uh, are going to be a little bit different than if you're, you know, identifying a goal that's more related to the fact that um, you're working on more muscle strengthening. So I think when we think about general fitness, you kind of have to sort of figure out what it is you're working on in terms of that specificity. Um, yeah. I think physical activity, you know, your, you know, and function, you know, there's definitely some overlap there, but I think if you're looking to, to kind of improve your strength, those activities are going to look a bit different um, than those that, you know, might be targeting more of, you know, your aerobic capacity and uh, fitness in that regard. 
and I suppose it's that question you know strength training and doing all those things does actually improve your aerobic fitness and all those different things so you do see a crossover effect so while you might be working on one very particular thing like I want to get stronger even if it's a a basic thing like I want to be able to do push-ups or be better at push-ups and you know look at actually strengthening um, my arms and my core that will help with aerobic capacity and endurance and fitness and all those other things throughout the day as well absolutely and and I think you know especially if you notice that doing the, the activities that you need to do, whether it's you know sitting down to participate in what you need to do for school or work, if you're feeling so tired because you know you've just exerted so much energy and you're less efficient in doing some of those other things like walking you know about your home or as I said, you know climbing stairs, um, that can definitely have a big impact on the things then that you need to sit down and focus for. So I think certainly there's a lot of carryover between you know what you're doing, whether it's as you said, strengthening or working on your aerobic you know capacity and fitness for sure. Um, and you mentioned, you know, mentioned strengthening and, and it makes me think about just, you know, another thing that, you know, for a long time, I think in, you know, in individuals with CP, it was thought that doing things like muscle strengthening would actually increase the muscle stiffness and increase the spasticity. Um, and so, you know, more recent research has certainly sort of discounted that belief. Um, and we do know that, you know, individuals with CP do benefit from engaging in regular strength training activities, and that it's not going to necessarily increase the stiffness and spasticity that you're experiencing because of the CP. Yeah, no, I think that's such a really important <laughs> really important point to emphasize um we've got a comment coming through from chris who's like nerf footballs was good for me absolutely in your comment section put the stuff that you love to do and all those activities that you might have been doing during this time because i think we can all learn from each other and work out you know oh wow that that activity i'd never thought of that before so you know please put them in the comment sections we'd love to hear from you um jennifer if we keep going on and i will just look at any other sort of questions and things that have come in um but going back to sort of thinking about what we're doing at home so what are some common household items objects that can be used to perform or replicate therapeutic activities at home you know i'd love to hear your list of fun ways of getting these things done Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point, you know, sharing amongst one another, uh, I think goes a long way. I think this is certainly a community effort to kind of share resources and ideas of what works and what doesn't work. So I think, you know, definitely a big fan of, of kind of sharing, sharing those ideas. Um, but definitely things that are in the house that you could kind of use to replicate what you might have otherwise used in, let's say, a gym setting or even a therapy setting. Um, let's say, for example, you're working on something like a step up and a step down and you don't have stairs where you live or a single mm-hmm. step to do it. Um, you could think about using either a very large sturdy book or a very, you know, a sturdy container um, or a step stool. So there's some ways that you can kind of mimic, you know, the activity of stepping up and stepping down either front or sideways. Of course, you always want to be mindful about, you know, positioning these items when you're using them for their not intended purpose to be sure that you're doing it safely. Um, But also things like stepping over, for example, an obstacle, much like you might step over a hurdle. Um, You could use something like the long end of like a broom or a mop or even a long umbrella uh, to kind of elevate it on something so that you can step over um, Mm -hmm. the, you know, the activity um, that you'd otherwise do, let's say, with a hurdle. Um, Other things that I think have been pretty creative, like using socks that are rolled up into like a ball and kind of, you know, standing up and throwing them into, let's say, like a laundry basket. Um, and then you'd be surprised what you can find in your pantry to kind of use as weights, because I think that's kind of a common, you know, feedback at this point is, well, listen, I want to get started with a workout routine, but I'm in my home and I don't really have any equipment, so can I get it done? Um, and so I think you could use, let's say, for example, you know, holding water bottles in each of your hands as you're performing, you know, an activity where you're going from sitting to standing. And some modifications that might need to be in order here, like let's say, for example, it's hard for you to grip, you know, the object, you can certainly put it in a bag and then hold the bag. So you're still sort of getting some of the resistance as you move through whatever, you know, the activity might be. So I think, you know, the story is, you you know, you have to be creative and I think you certainly, um, you know, be, you know, willing to kind of have to adapt it um, to what, you know, the needs that you might have. We've actually got quite a few different questions that have come in now. So uh, Chris Myers is asking, is our sitting tricycles or general tricycles good for exercise? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yes, 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 and yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think sometimes with cycling, it's good to also think about ways that you might need to modify, um, you know, modify either the way that, you know, someone's sitting on, on, on the tricycle or the, or, you know, the adaptive cycle, if that's what it might be, 
um, things like, you know, having to strap your foot to the pedal if it's hard to kind of keep it in a position that's ideal to kind of be able to pedal. Um, but I think there's both, you know, benefits from the aerobic perspective, um, but also just even, even coordination and moving your legs in that reciprocal pattern. So I think if that's an option, um, that would be a wonderful activity to do. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got another question that's just come through from Brad. He's curious about your opinion on maintaining interaction with your PT, OT provider via telehealth. For example, um, previously held in clinic one and a half hours twice a week. Would you recommend the same frequency for telehealth? And I think that's a great question because it's like, you know, if you're, and I think it depends on what you're getting out of it from your provider. But what's your, what's happening in your clinic right now? What's the, what's the norm? Yeah, you know, at the outset of all of this, I think, you know, I was a bit leery of how this would go in terms of trying to kind of conduct, you know, telehealth with all different ages. Um, uh, and I've, I have to say, I've been really surprised with um, a lot of the advantages that have kind of, that were unexpected. Um, and so I think one of the nice things about, you know, providing telehealth services um, is that you really get to see, you know, an individual in their natural environment. You know, so, so many times in the clinic, we're really doing so much to kind of replicate and sort of mimic what otherwise happens uh, in a natural setting. And so I think with telehealth, we've had an opportunity to kind of a window into what, you know, mm. what strategies might need, might need to be, you know, implemented in the home environment. So I think that that's been really great. Um, in regards to that specific question, in terms of sort of the frequency, you know, we've definitely sort of had uh, individuals that have kind of done sort of a hybrid model. And it just depends on what the goals are and what what the needs might be. So they may benefit from coming in, for example, you know, one time a week for an onsite visit. Uh, and then, you know, when you're working on some things that would otherwise be more difficult to kind of execute through a virtual setting, uh, and then maybe connecting on a virtual setting to kind of work on some things that, you know, the individual might be able to more easily do on their own. So I think, you know, we have to be open to it. You know, circumstances are, are certainly, you know, different for everyone and the comfort level of, of what that might look like. But, um, you know, and I think the reality with it is, as I always would say, you know, even if someone was coming in for, you know, formal physical therapy every day of the week, there's so much time outside of that window of, of PT um, where you're still continuing to learn, practice, uh, and benefit from whatever it is you might be doing. So I think that's a good thing to kind of bear in mind, regardless of what, you know, the delivery model might be at this point. Yeah. And I think for me, it would be, you know, if you're using those one and a half hours twice a week as your core time to do some really focused exercise, if you're still able to do that without having a telehealth visit, then that's probably okay as long as you're then checking in to make sure that you're increasing it as you need. But if you're not doing it at all then um, outside of it, then you're going to get probably a decrease in different pieces. So I think it, you know, to your point, it probably is a hybrid model that's the most effective. But if you're needing that one and a half hours twice a week for the motivational component and you're needing it to really make sure that it gets done, then, you know, if, if your provider does it through telehealth, I don't see that there would be a disadvantage to that at all. Same, yeah, I agree. So then the other comment is from Troy. So Troy uh, is doing Tai Chi classes. Um, Yang style might be very beneficial. Absolutely. Like I think any of the martial arts um, can be very beneficial for looking at um, motor control and body awareness and also strength and fitness. Absolutely. And yeah, I agree. The postural control piece, the balance piece, um, the coordination and kind of bringing all those things together. I think um, definitely you kind of hit, hit a few things all at once with that activity for sure. And what about some other sort of martial arts um, pieces? You know, I know there's a lot of different um, ones going on. Is there anything that people need to be concerned or aware of, or aware of uh, when, if they're going to start any of those activities? Yeah, I think if it's something that you've never done before, um, you know, you do want to probably do a bit of research to kind of see, you know, what, um, what supports, you, you know, might be available, for, you know, for you, um, and what ways you might need to modify the activity to kind of both enjoy it and be successful with it. Um, and I think with anything, you know, it's best to kind of start slow. And if, you, if you, especially if you've been particularly less active and more sedentary in the last few months, it's good to realize that anytime you're picking up something new, um, even in this, you know, kind of in this in this setting, you know, your body might just respond a little bit differently than had you had been, you know, active all along. So I think that's important to kind of respect, start slow, see how your body's responding um, before you kind of jump in and do a lot all at once. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you know, you wanna make sure that actually safety is a consideration and make sure that you don't get injured because once you get injured, then it's actually really hard to then, not only are you trying to strengthen, but then you're also rehabilitating at the same time. So it, 
it makes things a lot more complicated and a lot more complex. For sure. And I think that kind of leads into also the importance of, you know, if you're doing particularly a, 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 an exercise program for strengthening or for aerobic, you know, fitness, um, that you incorporate, you know, a warm up and cool down you know, so that you can avoid some of these, as we said, you know, musculoskeletal injuries, um, you know, because you don't want to suddenly then be, you know, excited about starting, you know, to be active and then have to kind of sideline it because, you know, you're nurturing something else that happened as a, a consequence, so to speak. So. Absolutely. And I think that's important, though, to also note that if you do feel like you've injured yourself, please reach out because it to a healthcare provider because it may be that you have. It's not just, you know, your typical, as we say, that sort of exercise soreness that you get. There could be something else going on. Um, we've got a question from Julia, and I know we're sort of getting a little bit short on time, but Julia would, like, what will benefit a child with quadriplegic cerebral palsy? You know, so what are some different things to sort of be able to focus on uh, if a child, you know, is, uh, you know, experiencing that? Yeah, so I think the same, similar types of principles in terms of, you know, thinking about what type of position your child might be spending in, in a better part of the day and figuring out how you might be able to incorporate, you know, I think in that case, you know, lots of different positional changes. So getting out of perhaps a wheelchair um, and, and being in a position, if it's tolerated, to be either, you know, a little bit flatter on the back or, on the, you know, on the stomach to kind of, let's say, get out of the position that you're in when you're sitting in, you know, a chair, just to kind of combat some of those, you know, muscles that are more prone to getting stiff because you're, you know, sitting, for example, in a, in a, in a wheelchair. Um, so I think, you, get, you know, changing the routine of what, you know, positions you might be spending a, a better part of the day in. Um, and I think, you know, also being sort of creative and in, in thinking about if there's an activity that, you know, you'd like to, you know, have your child, in, you know, being engaged in and just being willing to be creative and modify it. So whether it's, you know, helping them do, you know, yoga type positions to kind of get, you know, physical fitness and, and stretching in that capacity, I think. Um, for me, you know, I'd say, you know, pick what it is and let's figure out how we can modify it and get it done. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I think that's so important because, you know, we really don't want to underestimate anybody's abilities or anybody's desire to participate in any uh, particular activity. And I think that's really important to encourage, particularly as children are growing up, to find that piece that they really enjoy and, you know, to try and create these lifelong activity and healthy habits. Exactly. Um, Chris has asked, where would I find an adaptive tricycle? Chris, we will make sure that we send, um, post this different links um, to different places. Um, so make sure that you have that. Now, just want to follow up. Does anyone have any? Oh, there is one more final question. Okay, so uh, Maria is asking, my daughter is age nine and she has cerebral palsy and is having back aches. Um, is there a good stretch for her? And this I'd love to actually dive into a little bit deeper because it sort of comes to that idea of stretching. And, you know, thinking about the purpose of stretching and why someone might be doing stretching. You know, stretching won't necessarily change spasticity in a muscle, but there are other benefits to stretching that are really important to consider. Yeah, so I think, you know, just at the, at the start, you know, if it's a new onset of, of back pain, you want to, you know, be particularly cautious just to kind of monitor that and see if it really warrants, you know, different attention. But to start to figure out, is there something that's sort of changed throughout the last couple of weeks, days, you know, months, perhaps it could be very well that, you know, your child might just be spending a lot more time sitting and is experiencing some of these, you know, sort of effects of, of not moving around as much with regard to the, to your question, Rachel, about stretching, I think, you know, um, yes, we know for sure if, you know, you're just holding a stretch for a short period of time, um, it may not in fact have a huge benefit on, you know, changing your overall movement. You've got to kind of indicate, you know, perform the stretch and then, as best as possible, kind of um, encourage active movement afterward to, you know, kind of you know, do those two in combination and not just to kind of passively stretch a muscle and expect that the length is going to be changed uh, because you've stretched it. But I also think, you know, changing perhaps the position that, you know, your child might be sitting in for um, the day that they might be, as, you know, for example, at home doing virtual learning. Maybe it's a modification of the chair or the position of, you know, the height of the, of the, the desk that they're using. So just kind of thinking about the environmental components that could be contributing to some of that as well, I think can be quite helpful. Absolutely. And, you know, I think when it comes to, to stretching as well, just the, the benefits sometimes that you get just from the mobility and it actually can make you relax and feel, you know, just that little bit better as well. A lot of people can use it as a meditation piece or, you know, particularly a relaxation component. Um, I think it's important. All right, we've got one last question. These are great. 
<laughs> okay, one, one, this is the last one. Um, but uh, any recommendations for a nutrition plan for kids while maintaining an exercise routine? And I think this is important when we're thinking about any sort of increase in physical, physical activity and then the demands that that would put on somebody's nutrition. And this is when having a multidisciplinary team is going to be really important. Yeah, I would completely agree and not, you know, kind of wanting to overstep my, my boundaries of, of not being able to kind of provide specific nutritional counsel. But I think, you know, that goes in both directions, because I think some families have even sort of identified concerns about their child from being, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, perhaps not as active. And is there a concern that because of it, they're going to have, you know, weight gain um, as a, you know, as a result of just being less active. Um, but if you're, you know, ramping up your activity and, and doing something very different than you had been, and certainly some of these exercise programs for a short period of time, um, you would be quite more active. Uh, and it depends if your child's growing, might feel a little bit more hungry. So I think that's definitely, to your point, Rachel, really important to think about the multidisciplinary, you know, component of um, thinking about all those things, because we can't just sort of think about one piece and, and not expect, you know, that there might be changes needed in other domains as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when we're thinking about building muscle or any strength training, protein is such an important thing, for example. And, um, you know, having, speaking to a nutritionist or a dietitian, you know, and having them as part of your team to work out that program is going to be really important. So I think, you know, I just want to say thank you so much, Jennifer, obviously, for spending so much time with us today and answering everybody's questions. It's so wonderful, you know, to be able to have you on and, for, you know, for people to have this feedback. Is there anything sort of final thing that you would like to say? say? But otherwise, you know, I think we will, oh, just to remind everyone, yes, we will be sending out the links. We'll also be sending out all different resources, both from Jennifer at HSS and ones that we have in the foundation. So look out for those in sort of the coming days. Yeah, no, just I want to thank you so much for, you know, letting me have this opportunity. And like I said, I hope it's just sort of the beginning of, you know, getting everyone thinking a little bit more about this and being a little bit more creative about how it needs to happen because of what's going on around us. But um, yeah, so I hope it's, you know, gotten you thinking about how you might be able to change some of your habits um, and that we're in a community together. So keep sharing resources with one another because I think that goes a long way. Absolutely. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you again for joining us and thank you everybody else for tuning in and we will see you again next week. All right. Bye everybody.